I will I will record the meeting because uh, there are some people who would like to watch it, uh, but um, uh, they uh, are not able to to join. So let's start with the screen sharing. <clears throat> okay so here we go uh, you all know very well where i'm from so i don't need to introduce myself again or our place uh, but i do need to introduce tonight's um, uh, plan so we will start with the uh, with the only white that we have the marga Furwind Olas Riesling blend. Uh, I hope you have this chilled. If not, then, well, don't tell anyone I said this, but just throw a piece of ice in your glass. Uh, this will be our second red, the Kadarka. This will be our, I mean, this will be our second, that will be our second wine. This is our third wine, the Nana Ike Kramkosh. Again, if you don't want to open all of this, that's fine. Then uh, this beautiful label and this beautiful wine, the cake from from Panon Hama from the Cherry family will be our wine number four. Wine number five will be Attila Gerez Fekete Yardo wine, a rarity. And uh, we will finish with a blockbuster, the Trinitash or the Villani from on you guys' end. And uh, it was a beautiful fall day here in Budapest. And uh, it looks like this harvest this year is turning out really well. Uh, we had a colder spring and then we had a beautiful summer. We had a coolish, at least we had some coolish weeks in at the end of August, but then September and October have been pretty dry and, and pretty uh, uh, sunny. Uh, occasional rains happened and that's fine. So it looks like we are going to have a nice 2021 win vintage, at least for the, for the dry wines. And in Tokai, of course, uh, things are still up in the air, at least for the sweet wine. The dry wines have been harvested. Today, uh, we will taste wines only from the west side of the country. Coincidentally, this is how we are going to do it. Uh, so we will start with a wine from the Balaton region. Then um, we will go travel down to the south, to the Saxad region, this region right here on the Danube and very near the Serbian border. We will have two reds from there. Then um, we will take a trip up to Panonhama, uh, the smallest Hungarian wine region. Um, and then we will finish in the Villain region with two reds, the Jardovain and the, um, and, the, uh, and the Cabernet Franc. And, uh, it holds true for all of the regions that we are going to drink wine from that uh, winemaking was started there by the Romans. Uh, in some areas, even by the Celts, but Western Hungary was until the Danube was part of the Roman Empire. So there was winemaking here uh, back in the Roman days and ever since then. And even today, the um, the west side of the country is a slightly bit more developed, slightly bit richer than, than the, the east side, you know, generally speaking. And uh, the west side where we're having the wine from, wines from is, is all hilly, while, you know, the east side is, is a bit flat. Uh, that's where the great uh, plain is. Excuse me. Mm -hmm. 
yeah so let's uh, uh jump in and we will start with our white the very first one of uh, uh, today uh, the the wine comes from this lake that you can see on the on the photo as well and actually this photo was taken from the winery uh, where the Marga comes from uh, in the village of Chopak on the um, on the northern shore of uh, of the lake if you ever come to Hungary and uh, have a chance to drive around I highly recommend a day trip to to, to Lake Balaton uh, not only the wines but uh, the scenery is also amazing it's not just photoshop it's it's actually just as beautiful in in real life so uh, balaton uh, is a larger area uh, which is split up into six sub regions uh, if we want to simplify it i mean this large lake the lake itself is about 70 kilometers long and you know five seven kilometers wide and uh, uh, if you're at, wondering about the depth the depth is probably about 10 meters or so at, at its deepest so it's not you know we're not talking about the atlantic ocean uh, but it's a large lake for for you know eastern europe and uh, uh, we could simplify it in two ways we could talk about the northern you know wine regions where this wine is from and we could talk about the southern uh, wine regions uh, where uh, we don't have we don't carry too many wines from so the northern one is volcanic and very hilly and mostly white wine is coming from there and is divided into the Badachon area which is the western side of the, the lake the western edge is divided into Balaton Fudet Chopak uh, which is the northeastern part and it's Balaton Felvidék which is this area that, that is a little farther away from the lake. And uh, the far away Shomlo Hill and the Zala region is also actually part of, of, this, uh, of this lake uh, area uh, in terms of the, the vinification or the, the winemaking. It's, um, the northern part, like I mentioned, is mostly white grape. Some winemakers try to make red wine there as well. It's not um, even funny. Uh, somehow it's really only suitable for, for white grape, maybe because of this uh, really volcanic soil. And the southern part uh, of, of the lake is um, more sandy, clay, less, uh, so a little bit more simple. That is, a, although that is more suitable for red wines. And, uh, uh, the Chopak area focuses on Olas Riesling, Furmint, and probably uh, 20 other grape varieties are, are located uh, there and grown there. But um, Furmint and Olas Riesling are really the two most important ones. And these um, uh, went, both of them went into this blend. Uh, I am having the 2018. I'm not sure which vintage you guys have. Uh, in, uh, in any case, the, the main ingredient of uh, this wine is uh, Furmint, F-U-R-M-I-N-T, Hungary's most important white wine grape, as we discussed last time. And sometimes it's a single varietal, and at other vintages, uh, the winemaker, Tomás, puts 10-20% uh, of Olas Riesling in it. Uh, just to uh, uh, spice it up. So this is Furvin, that's how you spell it, and this is Olaf's Riesling, it's a longer name. Uh, he never ages this wine in, um, in oak, probably because he wants to express uh, the terroir, the minerality of uh, this uh, soil, and uh, if he put this, uh, uh, this juice, this wine into oak, then that would mask uh, the the um, sort of the nature the natural beauty of of this of this wine uh, it might still be a great wine but it would be a different wine but what Tomas wants to express is is what you know 
the soil expresses, the terroir expresses by itself uh, without any, uh, let's say, lipstick or any makeup uh, put on, you know, that, that would, you know, be the barrel aging. So this was fermented and aged in uh, part stainless steel and part uh, amphoras, clay amphoras, like in the Roman times uh, or like in Georgia. And uh, it spent eight months in these vessels and then it was uh, resting in the bottle for a while and then it was bottled and now it's in your glass. So uh, I think it's a very enjoyable wine. It has nice acidity. Um, I think it's, uh, it's a good food wine. It's, it's not a weak wine. It's a wine that is strong enough to go with uh, a bunch of dishes. I mean, seafood for sure comes in mind. Uh, and uh, it's, uh, in spite of the fact that it's not barrel aged, I think it has a nice depth. It's nice, round and smooth. And um, I, I've been enjoying it quite a bit. And I'm not sure how you guys feel about it, but I think it's a, it's a really well thought out um, creation. The name Marga uh, means it's a kind of soil, marl, M-A-R-L in English, which is a sedimentary soil. Uh, back in the millions of years ago, this area was uh, actually all of Hungary was covered by uh, uh, this ancient sea, which of course, through millions of years, left uh, a good amount of, uh, you know, dead shells and, and all of that at the, at the bedrock and, or at the bottom of the sea. And that, uh, even today, can be seen in stones, rocks, you can see old shells uh, and, and stuff like that. So that is the base of uh, the, uh, the, the soil, the area where, where this wine comes from. Uh, so enjoy it. Uh, Chopak, this, this uh, sub-region of the Balaton Furet region, has 2,000 hectares of vineyards. It's a big holiday resort, so, uh, you know, it, it's the largest body, Hungary body of water that Hungary has. So everybody wants to have some kind of connection to it. And uh, that's great because they have a lot of visitors at the cellar door. They can sell a lot of wine at the cellar door. But building up, uh, build, you know, the area getting built up is, is an issue. So some people just buy a vineyard and, you know, they, 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 they preserve a few rows. They put a swimming pool there and they say, okay, this is my winery. So <laughs> it's, not, it's, not, it's, it's not that great. We better watch out. But otherwise, uh, go there, come here and in any, any time uh, during the year, but definitely best if it's warm enough for you to also put on your bathing suit and jump in the water between two bottles of, of margas. And um, yeah, so if you don't mind, we can move on uh, and try our first red, Kodarka. Uh, and this one is from the uh, Saxad region, which I mentioned earlier. And uh, this is, in Hungary, this is considered a medium-sized wine region with uh, 2,200 hectares uh, planted, almost right on the Danube. Uh, this is not a volcanic area. The southern part of Hungary is, is more clay, loess, and limestone. This holds true for Saxon and Villain. And it's almost exclusively a red wine region. Uh, winemakers typically either do not make any white or else they make maybe one or two and then they would make eight other wines that would be all reds. And um, typically the whites are very simple and everybody's focusing on the reds here. And uh, Kodarka, Cake Frankosch, are very important. This is a Kodarka, and we'll also taste, we also have a Cake Frankosch in the lineup uh, from here. 
but they also grow international grapes like Merlot, Cabernet, Francs, and Sauvignon. And uh, Saxab is also the region which uh, uh, is allowed to use the term, the, the, the brand name Bicaver, Bull's Blood. We talked about this on our session two weeks ago. There's a historic red blend in Hungary called uh, Bicaver, Bull's Blood. Uh, it's always a red blend. And uh, there are two cities which can uh, use the name and that is for two regions. Uh, and that is the Saxad region, which we're talking about now, and the Eger region from the north, uh, which we were talking about last time. And uh, in both cases, uh, there has to be four to five, six different grapes that are in the blend. And the grape with the highest proportion in each case has to be Kate Frankos. So the Hungarian national, uh, or one of the Hungarian national grapes. Another interesting fact is that Ferenc Liszt, the composer, was a big fan of Saxad wines. He was a, a fan and a, a passionate uh, consumer of the wines as well. And uh, there is a wine style here called Schiller, which I listed at the very bottom of, of this page, which is a dark rosé, practically. A rosé which was mas macerated on its skins for uh, 24 to 48 hours. So it's actually, it looks like it's a light red wine. It's somewhere between, between the two. Uh, Schiller is, is also found in Austria. They call it Schilcher there in southern, in the Styria region of Austria. So I imagine uh, that uh, probably Austrian or German speaking winemakers brought this tradition over from there. And uh, that's just something I wanted to mention. Here's the map of the region. And uh, yeah, here we go. This is the town Saxad. It's uh, less than 100,000 uh, people uh, that inhabit it. And then it's a long region uh, going about 25 kilometers from uh, north uh, to south. And it's about six, seven kilometer deep. And the Danube would be, would be located somewhere right here in, in, in visible distance from, from these vineyards. And now let's talk about the grape a little bit, Kodarka. That is the grape that is uh, in the second bottle, 100% single varietal Kodarka. Uh, we talked about this wine uh, last year uh, when we had the COVID uh, wine tasting sessions. Uh, the name comes, the name of this wine is Bonsai, so named after the Japanese little uh, mini trees, and that's also reflected on the label. And the story is that uh, a Japanese wine writer visited uh, uh, Peter Vida, the winemaker, many years ago, and he took him out to the vineyard. And uh, these Kodarka grapes or vines are um, cultivated in the old fashioned way, so they are bush wines. They are not running on a wire, you know, in a cordon uh, that would make, that is a little bit more modern way to, to uh, grow vines, but they are just individual stocks, you know, with one stick uh, for each vine. And uh, these uh, grapes come from hundred year old uh, plants. So they are very old and uh, they, uh, of course, they are very thick and short. So the Japanese uh, guy guest immediately associated them with uh, the bonsai, mini miniature trees. And uh, the winemaker loved this uh, comparison and, and he, put it, he decided to put it on the label probably about a decade later, because he, 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 it took him a while to change the label or to decide it. And, uh, and uh, now it's on the label. The other thing that you can also see if you have the wine in front of you is these mini people under the bonsai, the mini tree. 
So that's also the philosophy, the approach of the winemaker to, to you know, grapes and wine, winemaking. That even a mini tree, okay, it's a mini tree, but people are even smaller than that. So he admires his uh, uh, craft and uh, you know the, the the plant that he works with. Uh, so otherwise, yeah, Kodorka is a is a grape that um, is not easy to work with. Uh, we will talk about cake frankos, which is uh, very common now, and that's much easier to work with. But Kadarka, an ancient, you know, uh, varietal, that's a nightmare to work with. It's a little bit similar to Pinot Noir because it has a uh, very thin skin. It's late ripening and it has large bunches, large berries. So that means the skin breaks easily. Uh, if the skin breaks, then it, you know, uh, different kinds of diseases can attack. Fermentation can start, uh, you know, immediately. So, so it's not a pleasant grape to work with. Uh, the reason why it used to be really popular uh, is actually the same reason why it's not so popular these days is because it makes very light wine, uh, low alcohol, light body. Uh, the, the color also is very, very light, you know, pale, uh, even, you know, just light, not even pale. Uh, or uh, I'm not sure actually which is the uh, better term in English. But anyway, so it's, 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 it's a light wine that people can drink uh, pretty much from the morning. I met, <laughs> I, I, I was taking this winemaking class uh, uh, I, that I started in January and I'm not going to make wine but I'm interested in uh, just the, the practical aspect so there was this guy who said okay I wake up at 6 a.m. and unless I have to drive I start with a shot of uh, palinka, you know a brandy and then um, then he he said that he has uh, breakfast from 10 eggs and uh, he doesn't drink anything until 10 a.m. And then he starts drinking. So if you're this kind of drinker, then, then it's good to have a light wine in, in, your, in your selection. And Kodaka is perfect for, for that. And uh, uh, until uh, the modern times, people did you know, drink while they were in the fields, while they were working uh, you know, in, in, the, in the garden, and so on and so on. So, uh, this, this wine was very popular. Uh, it has, uh, typically it has a spicy nose and a raspberry, cranberry, uh, strawberry, so a very fruity, red fruit uh, flavor, very fresh uh, flavors. And uh, this wine was not barrel aged. It was fermented and aged in stainless steel tank. Again, to preserve this, uh, the primary aromas of the fruit, uh, the raspberry, cranberry, juicy uh, kind of flavors. I'm a big fan of this wine too. Uh, it's light, but it's deep. Uh, I'm not saying it's the most complex wine, but it's 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 a very um, it's a very pleasant wine. <laughs> so it's it's also good to drink it uh, slightly chilled. Uh, it's more of a summer wine than a winter wine. Uh, Almost like a, almost like a rosé, very nice with pizza, uh, lighter dishes, soups. Uh, for grilling, you know, white meat uh, could work. So this is, this was our Kadarka. And uh, if you're ready, I can move on to the cake Frankosch. We're still in the um, in the Saxad region, so we're not going anywhere. But we are going to start talking about Hungary's currently most common red grape. You can see it on the label. Label on the label it says a couple of things: Sebastian is the producer, then Saxad is the name of the region, and then it says Nanai Kék Frankos. So Cake Frankosch is easy, that's the name of the grape. And Nana 
is the name of the, the hill that it comes from. Vintage 2018, and then blah, 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 just the alcohol level, 13.5. Uh, so this is still on the medium side of, of wine uh, or alcohol level. And it says two names on the label, Sebastian Chaba is Chilla. So Chilla is the sister and Chaba is the, is the brother. Also, you can see that uh, Saxat has its own uh, wine, how do you call it, a bottle. They have a, a little coat of arm and just Saxat printed on the bottle. It's a pretty elegant label or nice, elegant, classy bottle, which I'm, I'm a fan of. And um, Cake Frankosh is, um, is uh, grown all over Hungary. And uh, it is the primary uh, grape of the Saxad region. And it is the primary element of the, uh, of the Saxad, the uh, bull's blood. So it's a very important uh, grape. It is an Austro-Hungarian grape that um, in Austria it's called uh, Blau Frankish, in Hungary Cake Frankosh, and in Slavic countries it's called uh, Frankovka. We're talking about the same grape. Uh, nevertheless, it adapted to the different soils, different uh, climates, and uh, Hungarian Cake Frankosh is very different from Austrian Blau Frankish, and definitely different from a Croatian Frankovka. Uh, in Hungary, the old name for it was Nagy Burgundy. So big Burgundy, uh, I'm not sure how that name came about that, but some people still call it that. And uh, it's grown in all of the wine regions with three exceptions. Uh, Tokaj, which is exclusively a white wine region, and Shomlo and Badacsony, which are not exclusively white wine region, but they, they uh, really focus on, on white wine and they have a very limited selection of, of red wines uh, because it's just the soil is not really suitable for that. And uh, uh, Kadarka, the previous grape that we were talking about, was the number one grape uh, uh, variety of the country until World War II. And then communism came and everything was about quantity uh, rather than quality. And that's when cake Frankosh was planted all over the country. Uh, why is that? So there's a simple reason for that. It has a high yield. So from one cake Frankosh grape, you can have, you know, pounds and pounds, kilograms and kilograms of grapes harvested. So if you are just thinking about getting as much juice as possible from a first stock, then cake Frankosh is, is a friend and uh, you can have a lot of wine. Uh, it might be just stable wine if you, if you don't control your yield, but uh, it's gonna be a lot of wine. And it's also relatively easy to grow. It is a survivor. It is not going to have catch diseases. It is not going to break. Uh, the skin is not going to break and um, is just uh, sort of a safe bet for, for a winemaker. And since winemaking is so unpredictable, labor intensive, you know, a, a safe bet is, is pretty uh, important for a winemaker. So it's very popular. It became popular in the second part of the 20th century. And since uh, it became popular during the communist times, when everything was industrial, uh, Hungarians didn't really appreciate this grape until about uh, 15 years ago or so. And uh, everybody just looked at it as, you know, cheap table wine. And, um, and that's, that's really how I was looking at it. In high school, I was mixing it with Coke. And, um, you know, it's, it, it was not really uh, anything special. But then um, we started taking it seriously, typically, or, or uh, mostly because of um, uh, 
uh, again, uh, you know, people visit who don't, you know, for foreigners come here and then, and then they, they are very keen on local varieties and, and they were the ones who, you know, suggested and hinted that this, this could be something more interesting. In Austria, they take it really seriously and make pretty expensive, really full-bodied Blaufrankisches. And, uh, and now Hungarian winemakers also take it very seriously. And uh, uh, what you're having is, I think, an amazing example. It's, uh, it's barrel-aged in, let me see, 500 liter oak barrels and uh, for 19 months. So it's a fairly, you know, uh, heavy wine and uh, it should have nice, you know, velvety, tobacco, uh, sour cherry aromas, both on the nose and the palate. And um, I'm a big fan of this wine too, surprisingly. <laughs> so cheers, let's have a sip. I, I'm not going to drink all of the wines, it's a little late for that and um, uh, it would be a waste because now I'm, I'm alone so um, I, I will not be drinking all of them but I will drink the next one. So um, Cape Francoche is also an important factor it's a late ripening variety yeah, and it has medium tannins so it's not a very dry grape like let's say Cabernet Sauvignon and um, so uh, it's a very versatile grape. Uh, if, you, if you want to, we, we, and, and this versatility starts in the vineyard. If you want to make cheap table wine, you can grow three, four kilos of grape per vine on it. And that's going to be three, four liters of wine. So that's, you know, or three, four bottles of wine, the least per, per stock. So, you know, you can do that. You can, you can make cheap table wine or, you know, cheap rosé uh, with relatively little work. If you cut back on the yield, then you can make more concentrated wines that you can barrel age and, uh, and you can make a nice, uh, much more serious, you know, red, sort of like the one you're having now. And um, it is drinkable while it's young but it's also it's also very it's also very uh, uh, enjoyable, and actually it benefits quite a bit from uh, from barrel aging. It's not very common to 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 do it uh, to have a long uh, barrel aging and then actually a long bottle aging in Hungary for cake frankwash. But the ones that I tasted uh, have aged in a very very noble way. So I think it. It will. It has become a very important uh, great variety, and it is going to be even more important. I think uh, Cake Francoche and Furmint are going to be, and already are, really the, the two most important great varieties here. And there is a good reason for that. Uh, they are versatile. They are uh, uh, relatively easy to to grow. Uh, they are both aging, they, they both have uh, a lot of aging potential, uh, but uh, they are also suitable for uh, just making cash and, and sell them while the, the, the wines are still young and then somebody else can age that wine. So, um, and apart from all of this, Cake Francois, this grape, uh, is also a big, uh, let's say, uh, Casanova. It is the parent to many other grape varieties in, in Hungary and Austria, namely the Zweigelt, St. Laurent, or Blauburger grapes. Uh, these are all pretty common here. And this list continues. There could be a few more uh, grape varieties listed here that Cape Frankosch is, is uh, a parent to. Hi, Rick, nice to see you. And now uh, a new red and a new region, but still the same grape. And uh, I wasn't really sure what the order should be. You guys tell me if you are tasting all the wines. Mm, I wanted to, 
this this cake from course that we're moving on to might actually be a little lighter than the previous one but since the third and the second wine are from the same region i wanted to keep them together So from the southern region of Hungary, where Sebastian family is located, now we're moving up, driving up to the north, the Pannonhalma region. Um, this beautiful abbey that is on my picture is the center piece of, uh, of this region. And uh, they are very, very much connected to the winemaking. Pannonhalma, it's a nice long name, and uh, it is the smallest uh, Hungarian wine region. Only a couple of villages uh, use the name. Uh, there is actually a village called Pannonhalma, but the whole region is uh, named after that. And there are three or four villages that, that belong to this uh, tiny little region. Uh, only about 500 hectares of vineyards are planted in the entire region. So it's a tiny place. And most of uh, the quality wine come from one producer, the, uh, the, the Benedictine Abbey, the Pannonhalma Abbey, that uh, was founded in the year 1002, I think. So very, uh, very a long time ago. And uh, they... Uh, they brought in a bunch of grapes uh, along the centuries. And even today, the monks are involved in the winemaking. And uh, uh, due to their influence, they, most of the wines and grapes are international. So that would be Rhine Riesling, Chardonnay, Tromini, which is Gavur Straminer on, on the white side, and Cabernet Franc, Merlot, Pinot Noir, on the red side. So these are very, um, uh, very uh, common grapes in this region. Uh, nevertheless, the one we are having now is a cake from course. So we are still on the same grape. And, uh, and uh, so I mentioned that um, most of the quality wine comes from the Abbey. And uh, it's the only region in Hungary where sort of the wine making is so concentrated and uh, not that many families are involved or just other players are involved in the wine making in this region uh, other than the Abbey. And uh, most of the families actually make table wine with a few exceptions like the Cherry family that uh, we uh, are importing to the US and we are selling them here in, in our wine shop as well. This is again a barrel aged wine. Uh, it was aged for six months in a small Hungarian oak and then it was transferred to larger oaks, uh, larger oak barrels and, uh, and uh, it's one of the heavier cake from Cochise that that I have encountered. Not as um, spicy as the previous one. It is coming from a much cooler climate. Uh, it is a bit more crisp, a bit more acidic, uh, and it still has a lot of that sour cherry fruit in it that is so characteristic to cake from Kosh. If you, if you come visit uh, Hungary, Pannonhalma is a great destination too. Mm, there is an incredible library uh, behind the walls of, of the Abbey. Uh, it's, it's, it's like out of this world. And you can visit the winery of course, and the monks make different kinds of uh, liquors, and they run an amazing restaurant as well. So uh, they know what's good. 
And if you don't mind, uh, we can continue our tour uh, back to the south of, of Hungary, even further south than the uh, Saxad region. And yes, I see the right bottle. This, this is the one that we are going to taste. Attila Gere is one of the uh, most well-known producers of Hungary. And the grape, Fekete Jardovan, I'm torturing you guys with these names, uh, is one of the most obscure grapes that can happen. And practically, Attila Gere is the only, I mean, not practically, but he is the only, he is the only one who um, bottles this grape. Nobody else makes it. And I'll tell you the story how this happened in a minute. But also, let's talk about the region uh, first. We were trying wines from the Saxad region. This is a little bit further southwest. So we are right on the Croatian border. And uh, it's a narrow but uh, long region uh, spreading from west to east, about 50 kilometers long and 20-ish uh, wide with uh, over a dozen villages that uh, are part of, um, of this, uh, of this uh, uh, wine region. They all use the villa name. And uh, this is Hungary's prime red wine region. It's very fortunate, let's say. They are very fortunate. Uh, they have the warmest climate. Harvest and, uh, and, and bud break happens earliest here in Hungary. Uh, and uh, since Hungary is more of a white wine region, you know, a warmer subclimate, sub-Mediterranean climate like this is very precious. So they have no hard time selling their wines. Uh, they, they are very popular and they are also good at, uh, at marketing. They were also the first ones to start wine tourism and, you know, receiving guests in the 1990s. So they are uh, pretty, pretty savvy on, on, on the business level as well, not only on the, on the winemaking level. Cabernet Franc is the king here, uh, but they have a bunch of other red grapes, Cape Francoche Merlot, Portuguese um, is a local grape, table grape, Cabernet Sauvignon, Pinot Noir, and the list goes on. Uh, these are really just some of the more important. Uh, winemakers either uh, do not make any uh, red, uh, white wine occasionally. Uh, typically, they would make maybe one Olas Riesling as an entry level, uh, uh, you know, welcome wine, and then the rest is, is, you know, then you have a rosé and then the rest is red. So they, they really focus on, you know, like in Tokai, that's all white because of the cooler climate, the, you know, the sweet wine production. And here it's, it's sort of the opposite end of the country. And here it's, it's red wines because, because that's what the market demands. That's what they are, uh, have been doing for, you know, centuries. So red, red wine is, is the focus here. Uh, the soil, uh, just like in, in Sexad, it's more clay, plus limestone. I'm sorry, so you can still see him. I uh, will mute you guys. Uh, so um, the, it, it's clay, plus uh, limestone, and, and black forest soil. soil and uh, the size of this wine region is 2.5 thousand hectares. So it's a fairly uh, large area for Hungarian uh, standards. And uh, this is one of the emblematic uh, sites. This is the Sár Somjó Hely, uh, where Otila get actually the, the, where this Fekete Jardovány is planted. Uh, it's 400 and um, plus meter high, so it's not a very high hill, but uh, it still has nice exposure. Uh, this left side is facing the south. Uh, that is where the Kopar 
uh, vineyard is. And actually that is where this wine is coming from. Mm. Fecata Yardo wine used to be a common uh, grape variety according to the different documents and records in uh, the early 1800s, even the mid 1800s. And then uh, Phylloxera uh, happened. Phylloxera is the, the root bug that attacked the uh, uh, European vineyards. And um, that pretty much made the wine, this grape disappear. And uh, it only survived uh, the centuries in, uh, in these research labs uh, focusing on wine preservation and wine and grape uh, uh, preservation. And Attila Gere uh, of uh, Villain was researching and looking into old grape varieties and uh, it, he planted this uh, just a few stocks from it uh, first in the early 2000s and then in 2011 he already had enough about one hectare of land uh, planted with Fekata Yadovan that he was able to bottle it. He is the only one who makes this wine as a single varietal and uh, it has a nice acidity. Uh, it probably should have been served after the Kodorka that we had earlier but again I wanted to keep the regions together so uh, we're tasting it with the, with the Villa uh, group. Aged in uh, uh, large Hungarian oak barrels, 500 liter oak, and uh, uh, for you know six to ten months, more or less. Uh, I'm not sure who is unmuted, but if you don't mind, uh, could you check that you're muted? It's Rick. Okay, I, I think I found great. Thank you. Yeah, sorry, it's just easier to uh, for, for you guys. It's more enjoyable uh, to only listen to uh, one person at a time. Now I found everybody. Okay, so uh, this this is on the lighter side for red wine. This is on the more you know. Uh, it has a good refreshing acidity and a pale red cherry color to it. You can't, and you're not supposed to turn it into you know, something heavy with lots of barrel aging because then the barrel is going to overwhelm it. Uh, yet, uh, this guy spent uh, six to 10 months in, in Hungarian oak. Uh, I mean, I think it's a great wine and I also love the idea and the effort that Attila uh, put into uh, just bringing this ancient variety back on board and we can taste it. So last but not least, we are going to move on to the big favorite that everybody loves, including myself, and that is the Cap Frank, Cabernet, Cap Frank, Cabernet Franc of, um, of Erhard Heimann. And, uh, yep, so uh, along the years, the great Cabernet Franc became uh, Southern Hungary's and Villain's uh, signature grape. It has also become Hungary's fifth most important red grape. It's about so sitting here drinking pretty really important. Uh, it is not a Hungarian local ancient variety. It originates from uh, southwest France. The, the first records of it were, are dating back to the 1700s. But at that time, they were already recording how Cabernet Franc uh, was taken from southern France and it was planted in the Loire Valley by Cardinal Richelieu, um, that uh, who was a politician and also a big uh, wine fanatic. And he uh, was the one who 
decided to bring it up from southern France to the Loire Valley, where even today it is grown uh, and uh, it's a very important uh, grape variety there. From the Loire Valley, it went to Bordeaux and uh, in Bordeaux, it uh, is a blending wine. So along with Merlot, uh, Petit Verdot and uh, Cabernet Sauvignon, uh, it is blended. And uh, the reason why they keep it is because it, it's about a week, it ripens about a week earlier than Cabernet Sauvignon. So again, it's a safe bet for winemakers uh, to have you know, a well-balanced vineyard. Uh, some grapes are going to ripen earlier, so you are sure that you have wine. And then others are gonna ripen a little later, and then you're gonna hopefully make sure you're gonna have some big wine, you know, like a big Bordeaux that uh, you know, Cabernet Sauvignon is, is a big part of. So, uh, and then from Bordeaux, it, uh, it spread all over the world. It is grown everywhere. Uh, it is uh, the 20th most planted grape of the world. And uh, you can taste it in California, you can taste it in Chile, and uh, also in Hungary. And uh, interestingly, it does adapt really well to the climate, to the soil, and it, and it expresses this uh, pretty well. So the result that you get in the Loire Valley, Hungary, or South Africa, is going to be very, very different. In the Loire Valley, it's a typical cool, cool climate grape. In Chile, it's going to be somewhat pretty full-bodied. And in Hungary, it is going to be full-bodied, uh, spicy, uh, fruity, I think pretty well balanced. Uh, you know, it's not too tannic, not too dry. Um, I, I, it's, for me, it is really the go-to uh, red wine when I feel like having a nice heavy red. I, I'm a big fan of this grape. Uh, it, it has good acidity, uh, not too much tannins. It's really fruity. Uh, and again, ageability. It, it can be aged for, for a long time. We, we typically drink it too young. Uh, the one, uh, the Trinitash that I think you guys are also having is 2016. This is in good shape. It's a five-year-old wine, soon turning six. Uh, it's it's about time when 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 these heavier wines you know are showing a, a decent shape. So um, in Hungary we grow about fifteen hundred hectares of it, and a good chunk of that is in Villain. And in Villain they actually don't they don't even call Cabernet it Cabernet Franc, uh, they call it Villain Franc. And there's a story to, uh, to the American side, because I'm holding the same label that you guys are having. Nevertheless, on mine, it says Trinitas, uh, Cabernet Franc, and on yours, it just says Villani Franc. So that is the second time that we exported that wine to the US. And soon after we, ran out of the first batch over there, we were contacted by a winery called Trinitas in California. And actually it was the lawyer who contacted us. And uh, they uh, said that, you know, we have this name trademarked in the US and uh, would you be kind enough, you know, to uh, resign from uh, or, 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 you know, not use this name? and also destroy your inventory if, <laughs> if you don't mind. So thank God we didn't have any inventory left at the time. And uh, we wanted to make sure we don't run into some kind of legal issues. And uh, we wrote a letter back to Trinitas uh, Winery that, yeah, yeah, you're right. Uh, even though uh, maybe, maybe law would not be on your side because uh, Trinitas is the name of the vineyard where this wine comes from. So Legally speaking, maybe we could, and I'm not 100% sure, but I think you are able to put uh, uh, vineyard names uh, on the wine label. Vineyard names cannot be, cannot be trademarked, uh, at least not in the EU. Obviously, I'm not a legal expert. Uh, 
but I didn't want to uh, become one either. So we just decided to change the name for the next US batch. And that's why there is no Trinitash on the label anymore. It just says Vilani Fran. Otherwise, uh, the reason why we put Trinitash on the label and why this wine was called that is because that is one of the vineyards where it's coming from, from the Vilani region. Uh, so for Vilani, it's, it's a natural match. Uh, Michael Broadband, uh, an American journalist, a wine jour journalist, um, uh, said that uh, Vilani or Cabernet Franc found its natural home in Vilani and it produces nice spicy wines with ripe tannins, chocolate, tobacco, blackcurrant aromas, and a nice, you know, herbaceous uh, profile uh, when, it, when it ages uh, for uh, the right time. Uh, this one spent 24 months in small Hungarian oak, and, uh, and uh, again, I'm a big fan of this wine, <laughs> uh, at the right moment. Of course, it it is a heavy one. It um, it does have fifteen percent alcohol, so it's not the kind of wine uh, that you drink with lunch, or else you're gonna take a nice siesta uh, afterwards. Okay, so cheers, Egeshegatagra. Hmm. Come visit us, as always. My invitation is 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 up. We have um, we just had a gentleman here, uh, and it's actually really nice to see. Uh, we had a gentleman here uh, from Cincinnati, Ohio, and uh, he orders wine from us in the U.S. quite a bit. And we had a few other people earlier from the U.S. who were club members. And we have another gentleman and his wife and friends coming here from the U.S. in November. They are taking a cruise and visiting us and coming with us to Tokai. So it's really nice that uh, finally there is some, uh, you know, life outside of uh, the virtual area and the vir virtual uh, life. Uh, now we actually get to see real people and and. Uh, uh, get back to our original uh, you know lifestyle so i'm going to stop sharing this uh, screen now and uh, let's see if there are any comments so claudia as are the buildings in the photo houses or warehouses so you were probably talking about the vilani uh, photo these were all sellers and uh, they are so so these were all individual sellers the front part the little house building that you saw those were the entrances to these sellers and they typically are the pressing rooms so they would bring the grapes in those houses uh, process them there and they would pump the grape down to the cellar, which is right behind these, these little buildings. So they are press houses. And then from these press houses, the cellar would be dug into the, into the uh, 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 hillside. And uh, Marianne is wondering what Yardovain means. Well, I'm wondering that myself. I have no idea what it comes from. I have not found anything. Uh, Yarni means to walk, but I don't think that has uh, anything to do with the name. There is uh, fekete, fekete means uh, black. So there, that just refers to the fact that there was fehir yardovain, white yardovain, and fekete yardovain, black yardovain. So there was red and white uh, uh, grape of, of yardovain. But I don't know what the meaning is, I am sorry. I, when I find out, I will shoot an email to you. And um, I got away from Rick. Thank you. I owe you some wines. I haven't forgotten. Uh, they will be leaving next week. And uh, Miranda, thank you for the compliments. 
that I have a nice setup. This is our living room. And uh, sometimes I do tasting from here, sometimes from our shop. It was easier tonight to be here. And thank you, everyone. Sorry, just, we're actually the opposite. So my friend Pam here, who you can barely see, we um, went to the shop in 20 and 2017 2017 so we're, we're actually going backwards we were there in person and now we're virtual instead of the other way around so um it's it's a pleasure to be with you virtually but we started in person so this is this oh is yeah <laughs> thank you thank you we started in person also i know and yeah lots of nice dinners at your shop i know I know. I, I remember. We we still had, are not doing the dinners, so those um, we we advertised uh, a few for the fall. Uh, we advertised one with uh, the cherry winery. Yeah, there was not much interest. I think uh, we're still people are still a little bit afraid uh, of you know small spaces, and um, yeah, maybe something that worked you know two years ago um, uh, is just not going to work in the same deal same setup as you know we it used to be so it's fine we'll, we'll we'll give it a few more tries but so far uh not not that much interest yeah so marianne is saying yeah interesting that the faculty is not gorosh yeah um yeah i i don't know why that is um uh, yeah i mean sometimes you know uh, they call grapes red grapes uh, you can people say uh, uh blue grapes sometimes and also black grapes i i think um uh, maybe it's just you know the language changes uh, over the centuries okay uh, thank you guys uh, for uh, joining me and uh, if you have any questions you can always find me here is my email <laughs> California. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. So, um, yeah, it was great to spend an hour with you. And uh, you know where to find me. Uh, when I come up with an idea of uh, an interesting tasting, we'll make it happen again. And until that, uh, yeah, come to Budapest. Thank you, guys. We will. Thank you. See us, though. Good night. I think he was supposed to do the tasting at Capital One.